Welcome to NTD Evening News. Our top story tonight, a new order by President Biden sparking pushback from Israel. The U.S. details a response to the attack in Jordan and an apology from the U.S. Defense Secretary why Lloyd Austin hid his hospitalization. Iris Tao in Washington, D.C. As Israeli troops continue to fight intense battles in the southern Gaza Strip, an unexpected guest shows up on the front lines. This comes as the UN agency providing aid to the Gaza Strip said it could soon shut down operations. Jason Perry reports. New York City and Boston today dealing with the effects of illegal immigration. We take a look at the impact illegal immigration is having on everyday Americans. Months of negotiations around a border security deal now coming to a close. Senate Leader Schumer today announcing we'll see the details, but mounting GOP opposition may mean it's already at a dead end. Former President Trump loses a legal battle in the UK. Find out more about his lawsuit over the Steele dossier and how the judge responded. This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. We open with some breaking news. The man who was responsible for the largest leak of CIA material was sentenced. A federal judge in Manhattan handed him 40 years in prison. 35-year-old Joshua Schulte was a CIA employee until 2016. He was convicted for leaking troves of classified information to WikiLeaks. The information reportedly revealed how the CIA hacked cell phones and tried to tap smart TVs. Schulte also handed over to WikiLeaks an arsenal of CIA's intelligence gathering cyber tools known as Vault 7. WikiLeaks started publicizing them in 2017. Prosecutors called the leak some of the most heinous, brazen violations of the Espionage Act in American history. Schulte's defense argued that the crimes, quote, represent aberrant behavior in an otherwise law-abiding life. President Biden has green-lighted a response to the deadly drone attack by an Iranian-backed militia, and the defense secretary is vowing forceful action while apologizing for his secret hospitalization. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more. Amid public backlash over his lack of transparency, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin on Thursday said he's sorry to the American public and to his boss, President Biden, for not telling them about his hospitalization over prostate cancer surgery for days. Watch. My first instinct was to keep it private. I never liked uh, burdening others with my problems. I've apologized directly to President Biden. And I've told him that I'm deeply sorry for not letting him know immediately. Austin's hospitalization sparked backlash partially because it came at a time during what he himself called a dangerous moment in the Middle East. The White House on Thursday said that President Biden had made his choices and his decision on how to respond to this Sunday drone attack in Jordan that killed three American service members. And as the White House says we are going to move out, Secretary Austin said it would be a multi-tiered response. You know, I don't think the, uh, the adversaries are of a one and done mindset. Uh, and so uh, they have a lot of capability. I have a lot more. Meanwhile, President Biden on Thursday issued a new executive order sanctioning four Israeli settlers in the West Bank who have been accused of attacking Palestinians in that occupied territory. While Biden argues that the attacks could undermine the viability of a two-state solution, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu quickly criticized Biden's decision, saying that the vast majority of Israeli settlers in the West Bank are law-abiding citizens. Meanwhile, also on Thursday, President Biden campaigned in Dearborn, Michigan, a place with one of the largest Muslim and Arab American populations in the United States. The group, which is growing increasingly critical of President Biden's handling of the war in Gaza, could be critical in the upcoming 2024 presidential election. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. As intense battles unfold in the southern Gaza Strip, Israel's defense minister makes a timely visit to the front lines of the war. This comes as the UN agency that provides humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip says it could soon shut down. Entities Jason Perry has the latest on the war. Go 
In a video released by Israeli forces on Thursday, soldiers in the 55th Brigade are seen battling terrorists in Khan Yunus in the southern Gaza Strip. And an apparent smoke grenade was set off nearby, which allowed the troops to move to new positions without being seen. After two months of operations in Khan Yunus, Israel's 55th Brigade has now left southern Gaza and has been replaced by other forces in the area. Israel's defense minister visited troops in Khan Yunus and told them they must persevere until they complete their missions. And it is much more difficult for Hamas, believe me. They don't have weapons, they don't have ammunition. They have 10,000 eliminated terrorists and another 10,000 terrorists who are wounded and not functioning. This is a serious blow that erodes their abilities. And he said Israeli forces will also reach Rafah, which is even further south than Khan Yunus near the Egyptian border. But despite such heavy losses, Hamas terrorists still managed to continue fighting, releasing two videos on Thursday showing multiple attacks on Israeli troops. And residents of the Gaza Strip appear to be caught in the middle, now wondering where their next meal will be coming from. On Thursday, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA, which provides humanitarian aid to Gaza, said it could shut down operations at the end of February if funding doesn't resume. Multiple countries stopped funding UNRWA after an Israeli intelligence report accused UNRWA of having 190 terrorists as employees. Gaza residents shared their thoughts. If the UNRWA stops, there will be no food, drink or life in the Gaza Strip. There would be no aid or anything in Gaza. Also on Thursday, residents in Israel called for an immediate release of the 136 hostages who remain in the Gaza Strip. It's three months before, uh, since they were kidnapped and uh, we, we're in Israel. People cannot, cannot live, cannot sleep, cannot breathe. We feel the pain, we feel the stress, we feel the tragedy. It's really a disaster. On late Wednesday evening, Israel's prime minister said Israel is still actively working on negotiations to release the hostages. And he added that any proposal will not come at any cost to Israel, such as ending the war or releasing prisoners. Jason Perry, NTD News. The European Union today reading a deal on more support for Ukraine. The leaders of the 27 member countries agreed on an aid package with over $50 billion. This comes despite threats from Hungary to veto the move. Uh, this is good news. Uh, Ukraine is our priority uh, and that is why we needed this agreement uh, today by all uh, 27 member states and from within the EU budget. That Hungary lifted its veto came as a surprise. Relations between the two countries have been tense. Hungary has long criticized Ukraine for allegedly curbing the rights of ethnic Hungarians. The financial package was part of a review of the EU's continuing seven-year budget, which requires unanimous approval. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky today thanked the EU for the funding. He says this is a clear signal that Ukraine and Europe will withstand Russia's invasion. New York City and Boston today are dealing with the effects of illegal immigration. The New York governor is now saying authorities should consider deporting the suspects identified in a recent attack. NTD's Arian Postar has more. A group of people believed to be illegal immigrants recently attacked two police officers near Times Square. The young men punched and kicked the officers in their heads while they were lying on the ground. Manhattan's district attorney's office confirmed to NTD that the suspects have been released without bail. And New York Governor Kathy Hochul now says that officials should consider deporting the suspects. Democratic Councilman Robert Holden tells NTD he agrees with the governor. You kick an officer in the face several times and punch an officer who's doing their jobs, you should, be, you should not have the right to walk the streets of New York City or America, for that matter, at all. Uh, I don't know why we're called a sanctuary city because we want to protect criminals. No, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Meanwhile, in Boston, a recreational center in a predominantly black and brown neighborhood was transformed into a shelter for immigrants overnight. Boston Democratic City Councilor Erin Murphy recalls what locals say about the decision. Why are other people right, getting, getting things when we need them here in our city? Boston is a sanctuary city. 
Massachusetts is the only state in the country with a right to shelter law, meaning it has to provide housing to anyone who needs it. Murphy tells NTD it might be time to take a closer look at those laws. It doesn't make you a bad person because you're questioning how much can the state take, how much can our city handle before we have to really shut down and take a good look at what, what are those effects. And if they're negative effects, we have to decide is that something we want to continue to do. The governor of Massachusetts said she is looking at alternative sites to house the immigrants, but that there are none available at the moment. Ariane Pastar, NTD News. Help is on the way for Texas as the state deals with the southern border crisis. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis today announced his plan to deploy more National Guard members to the Texas border. Uh, I believe that a state has a right to fortify its own borders. Uh, and so if Texas is helping to erect barriers, putting up razor wire, doing other things to keep illegal aliens out, I want to be helpful with them doing that. I don't want to be part of the federal government trying to tear down these barriers and let more people in illegally. This is Florida is prepared to deploy up to an entire battalion of its National Guard, which is around 1,000 soldiers. It will also deploy members of its own State Guard for the first time. This in addition to the more than 90 officers from other Florida law enforcement agencies. The goal is to help Texas strengthen the barricades and razor wire at the border. 27 states have formed a coalition to help Texas deal with the influx of illegal immigrants. Florida has been directly assisting Texas to secure its border since 2021. It has already sent more than 700 members of the Florida National Guard. In his speech, DeSantis again criticized the Biden administration for the border crisis. He said Florida is helping to, quote, stop the invasion of illegal aliens. Hours from now, we could see details of the Senate's bipartisan border deal. This as House Republicans intensify their resistance. NTD's Melina Weiskup is on Capitol Hill with the latest developments. After months of negotiations in the Senate, a highly contested border bill will soon be released. Senate Leader Chuck Schumer saying they plan to post the full text of the bill as early as tomorrow and no later than Sunday. These challenges at the border and in Ukraine and the Middle East are just too great. The leader is pushing for a vote by next week. But with growing opposition to the deal, it's unclear how much Republican support it will get. You're asking me a question I can't answer right now, which is what is the, the fate of it? House Republicans stand in strong opposition to it, pointing to rumors that it would allow for thousands of illegal crossings. That they want to allow 1.8 million individuals to still come into the country. You're legalizing the illegal activity that's taking place. Is that it allows for 5,000 entrants per day. That's, that's just, that's a non-starter. I don't even know why the Senate thinks that's a starter. Supporters, meanwhile, have tried to debunk this claim. So it's never been about codifying 1.8 million. That's patently untrue. It will be proven untrue in the text. Even if it can pass the Democrat-controlled Senate, its fate is grim in the House. Speaker Mike Johnson saying bluntly it has no chance of getting a vote. Democrat Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries leaving the door open to taking matters into their own hands. Would you consider... Um trying to get around Speaker Johnson if he doesn't bring it up to the floor. We have to evaluate the substance of the legislation before we decide the best procedural course of action. Now, the broader question here is if they aren't able to get this border security deal to President Biden's desk, how will Congress move forward with aid to Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan? Reporting from Capitol Hill, Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Meanwhile, representatives in the House passed a bill to deport illegal immigrants who are caught drunk driving. Nearly 60 Democrats joined Republicans to approve the measure, while about 150 voted against it. In the UK, a judge today dismissed a lawsuit filed by former President Trump. It stems from what's known as the Steele dossier from 2016. In his lawsuit, Trump said that former British spy Christopher Steele made shocking and scandalous claims about him in the dossier, that the claims were false and harmed his reputation. Trump sought damages from Steele's company. But the judge decided to toss out the lawsuit. She said there are no compelling reasons to allow the claim to proceed to trial. U.S. government investigations found that Democrats paid Steele to write the dossier during the 2016 presidential campaign. In it, he made unverified and discredited claims that Trump's campaign conspired with Russia. 
The dossier became public after a media leak in early 2017. It fueled the Trump-Russia narrative and the FBI's crossfire hurricane investigation. Welcome back. The judge in former President Trump's civil fraud case was expected to issue a ruling by Wednesday. New York Attorney General Letitia James is asking for a $370 million fine and a lifetime ban on the Trump Organization. We turn now to NTD's Arlene Richards to find out what's at stake. Arlene, how do you think the judge is going to rule? Well, there's no question he's going to put a, a significant fine on the former president and his children. Uh, he's going to severely restrict them from doing business in New York. Now, this is going to be a major blow for Trump because he has built his reputation on the uh, real estate empire in New York. Now, in terms of that real estate, give us some examples of the assets that he does have in New York. So this involves several assets of high value in New York, including his Manhattan building, Trump Tower, also his office building called 40 Wall Street, the residential building, Trump Park Avenue, and an estate north of New York City known as Seven Springs. Now, the claim here is that Trump and other defendants allegedly inflated the value of these properties to get a larger bank loan. Now, the banks haven't complained about this, and all of their loans have been paid back in full, according to Trump and the bank, uh, bank uh, representatives. But Letitia James says that former President Trump has committed a major fraud, and she thinks he should be run out of the city. On that note, what is the likelihood that this judge would prevent Trump and his family from operating their businesses? Well, I think it's very likely in September he ordered that Trump cancel all of his business licenses. Now, those cancellations would mean that he would lose control over all of his New York properties. In addition, the judge appointed a monitor, former federal judge Barbara Jones, to oversee Trump's businesses. Now, he asked her to identify fraud. She recently reported that there were some inconsistencies involving a $48 million loan. Now, Trump's attorney, Chris Keis, said that she hadn't found any discrepancies in her last six reports. And he said that she's been paid $2.6 million to now find what he calls immaterial disclosures. Hmm. Now, Trump hasn't canceled those certificates yet, but can the judge take away his assets? According to a legal expert, Mark Zauderer, Trump would have to be compensated for the sale of those assets. And he says that if the Trump name is taken off the buildings, that would significantly reduce their value. Wow. Well, Arlene, thank you for that report. Sure. On Capitol Hill today, lawmakers zooming in on Beijing's human rights violations. The hearing comes after a review by the United Nations in which member countries questioned Beijing's compliance to international human rights law. Entity's Sam Wong has a report. I'm holding up an image that shows many current political prisoners in China. My heart aches terribly every time I see this picture. The woman speaking is Sophie Luo, wife of the prominent Chinese human rights attorney Ding Jiaxi. Like those on the picture, Ding is one of the many people who were detained for railing against the communist state. Last year, Chinese authorities handed him a 12-year prison sentence. His wife now lives in the U.S., but she told me she hasn't heard from her husband for months. I know my husband. The moment he settled down in the jail, he will write to me, write letters to me. But right now, I didn't receive any letter for, for almost three months. The last letter I received from my husband is October 10th. It's uh, through the lawyer. I never be able to directly communicate my husband. Congressman Chris Smith is the chairman of the Congressional Executive Commission on China. In Thursday's hearing, he detailed Beijing's force of organ harvesting against prisoners of conscience. The victims include Falun Gong practitioners and many others. One of our doctors who testified said somebody was in shock, uh, and, and that person, as he was taking out the organs, started moving around because he was feeling uh, the knife. Last month, Beijing's human rights violations were under public scrutiny by a review body at the UN Human Rights Council. Congressman Chris Smith told me China had once again, quote, gamed the system. And what they do against the Falun Gong, what they do against the Uyghurs, you know, they say there's no genocide. This proved that even in what should have been a transparent Human Rights Council meeting, um, they did everything they can to suppress the truth. Lawmakers, along with the witnesses, urged world leaders to raise human rights during meetings with top CCP officials. 
Reporting from Capitol Hill, Sam Wong, NTD News. The CEO of TikTok and other social media platforms faced questioning from senators on Wednesday over child exploitation. Senator Tom Cotton pressed the TikTok CEO on his ties to the Chinese Communist Party. The CEO denied such ties, but Xi Fleet, a survivor of China's Cultural Revolution, says the situation is not so simple. She joins us to explain why. Xi Van Fleet, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thank you. It's always great to be back. Now, Senator Tom Cotton has come under fire. This is from Congressman Victor Xi and Ted Liu calling his line of questioning of the TikTok CEO as racist and disgusting. Now, what did you make of the senator's questions? Were they fair? The question is absolutely legitimate. Absolutely a great question because people either don't understand or pretend that they don't understand that in China, everything, everything is under control of the CCP, including so-called private company and the private organizations, and of course, everyone in it. So there's absolutely zero chance that the CCP would allow someone to control TikTok as a CEO that is not part of uh, uh, the CCP. Okay, he may not be a member, but he definitely, definitely is their puppet. And there's absolutely no question about it. And I think Americans should really wake up. They know so little about communism and they know so little about CCP. Help us understand that this concept of private companies in China, if they exist, you posted on Twitter or X, um, TikTok's parent company ByteDance in their party branch having a giant Chinese Communist Party flag. Who is in control here? Party. It's always the party. And they have implemented this system called a uh, party branch ever since they took out power. Every organization, there is a party branch. And what it does is to really ensure that everything there follow the party's uh, instruction, party line. And so, and especially for such an important asset as TikTok to the CCP, they would never let someone just run it. And someone, it doesn't matter who this person is. It might be from Singapore, might be from Taiwan, might, might be from United States, unless this person is absolutely under their control. On that note, Senator Tom Cotton is defending his line of questioning. He was telling Fox that, quote, Singapore, unfortunately, is one of those places in the world that has the highest degree of infiltration and influence by the Chinese Communist Party. Now, give us a sense of how that type of infiltration and influence works. How are people, Chinese people or even dissidents living overseas sometimes coerced to toe that party line? I think Singapore probably is one of the most infiltrated, but so is here in the United States. We even have uh, CCP's police station in San Francisco and a flushing of New York. It is everywhere, but for the uh, Singapore, I think it's especially the case. CCP consider every Chinese, no matter what your citizenship, they consider they are the owner of all Chinese. And they always ask the, uh, the Chinese to be patriotic, to love the, their motherland. What they're really doing is to make sure that they love the CCP. And this is something that a lot of, a lot of dissidents in America has to deal with. They have to deal with the CCP's infiltration and their attempt to control all of us. Mm. Now, Senator Tom Cotton went on to tell Fox that the TikTok CEO, quote, has a lot to answer for for what his app is doing in America and why it's doing it. Now, what do you see as the impact of TikTok in America and why is there a different version in China called Douyin? I know. Why? That's a very good question. The, in, in China, they control the time that the young people can use it. Usually it's from, uh, um, from 10 o'clock in the uh, eight or 10 o'clock in the evening until next morning. They cannot even access it. And the content is different. The content is strictly con uh, controlled and so all academic. Um, or they want the kids to learn. Why? Because they want the kids 
to learn so that they will be the builders for Xi's empire. And the TikTok is totally different version. It is a version for the CCP to infiltrate and control the minds of the Westerners and American kids and to uh, indoctrinate them with all sorts of ideology. So that's why the Democrats love it. The Democrats will do anything to defend it. And they use all sorts of uh, a reason to defend it. Of course, one of their um, tactic is always racism, right? If you question the CEO of the TikTok, you are racist. And what they're really doing is defending uh, CCP. Why they defend CCP? Because the CCP and the Democrats and the, uh, uh, the radical left, they have one shared goal. That goal is to destroy America. Quite concerning indeed. Shivan Fleet, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Leaving class nine times a day to make videos for social media. A school in North Carolina is taking drastic action, removing bathroom mirrors. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on the school's unique solution. Feeling overwhelmed by the extreme bathroom overusage, one North Carolina middle school decided to fight back by removing the bathroom mirrors. School public information officer Les Atkins spoke with local TV station WFMY. Students were going to the bathroom for long periods of time and making TikTok videos. The school says there has been a big drop in bathroom breaks since they removed the mirrors. And they now use a digital hall pass system, which helps keep better track of where students are throughout the day. The school says it chose this solution rather than take kids' phones away because some parents wanted their kids to have phone access for safety reasons. Dr. Chris Cortman says a big danger from apps like TikTok is that they severely damage attention span, which causes users to want instant gratification without putting any work in. In fact, we have plenty of research on, on the importance of, of self-discipline and how self-esteem is not what we should be teaching kids. We should be teaching them self-discipline because that's how they get to self-esteem is by learning how to discipline. And, and that means they have to delay gratification. They have to work hard towards something. You gotta show it up at the gym like every day for years before you go, hey, check this out. You know, the, the things that they want in life are going to come because they have the capacity to, to, to continue uh, to, to to invest in, in their goals, to, to day by day do the right thing. Cortman says he has no issue with how the school solved the problem, and he likened parenting to spotting someone in the weight room. The job of the spotter is to give you exactly as much help as you need, not more help and not less help. The TikTok shrink also thinks kids will lead more satisfying lives if they can get away from the shallow focus of being beautiful on social media. There are so many other things that are important in life besides being sexually attractive. You know, that, and they're, they're neglecting a lot of those things that really matter in the long term. I'm not saying that there's no point or, or no purpose for being attractive, but if that's the focus, if that's the only thing that matters, if you build your world around that, you're not a well-balanced person. And, and the irony of it is you'll have people attracted to you until they get to know you and see how incredibly shallow and that your world is built around your looks. TikTok is banned for federal and state employees in about two thirds of US states. And a law in Florida from last year stopped TikTok from being used on school devices and Wi-Fi networks. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. A new report says 85% of colleges have restrictive speech codes. The Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression says much of the restricted speech is protected by the First Amendment. NTD's Virginia Gibson has more. The Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, or FIRE, says around 85% of colleges have what the group calls restrictive speech codes. Out of nearly 500 schools studied, around 20% earned a red light rating, meaning they have official policies the group considers to substantially restrict free speech. 
notable schools include Princeton, the University of Southern California, and the University of Notre Dame. One that we see that's fairly unfortunately common is, is a restriction that says something like you can't engage in offensive expression. Uh, well, that's inherently extremely subjective because, you know, one person may think that a certain type of speech is offensive where, where another will not. Laura Belts is the director of policy reform at FIRE. She says colleges should be centers of debate and inquiry where students can explore all sorts of different topics. She says these kinds of policies prevent that. Policies such as the only place that you can express yourself is a small out of the way area on campus. They're often referred to as free speech zones. Uh, and, and we also see things like saying that you can't put up flyers unless you're a part of a recognized student organization or that you have to put your name on all of the pamphlets that you hand out. And, and all these things can chill speech. Others include civility policies, mandating students to speak civilly. Belts calls this a subjective standard. A peaceful pro-life demonstration may appear civil to some, but uncivil to others. Biased reporting policies, speech or conduct that may involve what a college considers to be gender bias, racial bias, or age bias. Belt says these are pervasive across campuses, and the consequences for violators are usually vague. Virginia Gibson, NTD News. Welcome back. If you're just joining us now, here are some of today's top headlines. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin apologized for failing to report his hospitalization on time. He said, quote, I did not handle this right. He also said he should have told the president about his cancer diagnosis. The U.N. agency providing aid to Gaza said it could shut down operations at the end of February if funding doesn't exist. At the same time, Israel is still actively working on negotiations to release the hostages. Contents of the bipartisan border deal in the Senate could be released soon. Senate leadership waited, waited a vote on it by next week, but House Republicans intensified their resistance. New York Governor Kathy Hochul said it's worth checking into the illegal immigrants who attacked NYPD officers, and Boston converted a neighborhood recreation center into a shelter for illegal immigrants. Videos of a mob of illegal immigrants attacking NYPD officers in Times Square have gone viral. Joining us now to discuss his reaction to the attack and what the city should do about it, we have Jason Johnson. He's the president of the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund. Jason Johnson, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Now, a group of illegal immigrants attacking two NYPD officers in New York has been making headlines. How has the current bail and sanctuary status been fitting into this? Help us understand that. Well, this incident, I think, paints the perfect uh, sort of picture in a bad way of what America's law enforcement officers are dealing with. Um, these officers not only were encountered by, encountered by you know, aggressive, uh, apparently, uh, illegal migrants who had entered the country illegally, nevertheless were in New York awaiting for some uh, hearing that might take place in 10 years or so, and feel perfectly free to attack uniformed NYPD officers right there in, in Times Square. And there's, so there's that, there's the immigration issue, but then also there's the issue of it. These officers, and you can tell they're dealing with these, uh, per, they're being attacked, first of all, and they're, they're not even... Um, that you can tell they're afraid to use any force at all on the, the first gentleman that attacked them in order to make an arrest because New York has this diaphragm law that prohibits officers from placing any pressure on a person's chest while they're being arrested. And you can see how that comes into play here where the officers are being very, very careful, more careful than they should be if they're interested in protecting themselves. And then third, you have the issue of cash bail, which you know, even after these people are arrested and they enter the criminal justice system, even though they're in the country, un, you know, illegally, even though they've attacked law enforcement officers, they're let right back out on the street just to do it again. And at least one of them uh, already had a, a record of a prior arrest. So it's, it's very troubling on all those levels. On the note of law and order, what measures are in place to ensure that there is justice regardless of immigration status? 
Well, you know, I mean, uh, I think most people would argue, certainly I would argue that if you're if you're in the country seeking asylum and you attack law enforcement officers, that you should simply be removed. Um, it should be that simple uh, as a remedy. And there it shouldn't we shouldn't have to wait for some removal hearing. Uh, there should be a quick hearing and then the per, and then the individual should be removed um, if they were in the country lawfully. Even if they were in the country lawfully, there should be swift and certain consequences. Uh, due process, of course, but one who attacks a law enforcement officer in the in the in the way that we see clearly on this video, uh, they should be charged. They should be held pending their trial because of the risk that they present to public safety. And then there should be accountability in the form of 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 a, of a sentence of incarceration. Um, and it's that simple. Now, these released illegal immigrants were then seen flipping off media cameras. How should the city respond to such behavior? Well, you know, I mean, the act of flipping off a camera, of course, is constitutionally protected. But I think it I think it does, uh, you know, the, it tells the casual viewer how the contempt uh, that these folks have um, for our law enforcement, for our, even for our communities here in the United States, in New York City, one of the most, uh, by the way, one of the most racially and ethnically diverse cities on the planet. And uh, so it has nothing to do with um, national origin or anything like that. But if you're going to if you're going to come to the United States, if you're going to go to New York City, you need to respect the laws and we need to have a system that uh, that demands that respect for our laws and for our law enforcement officers. On that note, New York's governor, Kathy Hochul, is suggesting deporting these individuals. Now, New York City is a sanctuary city. So how does New York balance public safety while housing all of these immigrants? Well, you know, I, I think we all uh, can admit to seeing signs of hypocrisy in the in the sanctuary city, not not only New York City, but other other so-called sanctuary cities. Um, that it's very easy to call yourself a sanctuary city uh, when you've not been flooded with migrants. And now cities like New York and Chicago are receiving, um, you know, significant numbers of migrants in the city, and they've openly complained about how difficult it is to deal to be able to address. The resource needs uh, of these migrants, and so um, some of the rhetoric has started to change. So while I, I wholeheartedly agree with the governor that these people uh, who, who attacked our law enforcement officers should be removed from the country, um, I, I think we need. I think it, this should be the impetus for a more serious conversation about how we treat people who have illegally entered the country, generally, and start to walk back some of this idea of of having migrant. Uh, migrant cities, migrant, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, sanctuary cities, sanctuary counties, and other jurisdictions, because in reality, they should all be, uh, all these cities should be cooperating with the federal government uh, as the federal government tends, uh, attempts to enforce our immigration laws. And how do activities like these, these immigrants, illegal immigrants attacking police officers, impact those who are in the country genuinely seeking asylum? Well, it's uh, you know it's a bad look. Obviously, uh, it would it gives the impression that every single person who is a migrant, or even every single person who's who's entered the United States illegally, uh, doesn't have any respect for our laws. And um, I don't know that that's always the case, but I certainly think that when you open the border and you allow anyone to enter without being vetted in any way, we don't know what the prior criminal background of any of these folks. We don't know if they're members of uh, street gangs or we don't know anything about them. And I think that's the point is that when you when you let anyone into the country and you don't know anything at all about them or their background, you really are asking uh, for things like this to happen. Jason Johnson, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. A powerful storm that bore down on much of California yesterday continued overnight into today. Officials urge residents to brace themselves for the heavy rain. NTD's Stephanie Sakal has a weather update from Los Angeles. California is facing back-to-back -back storms known as atmospheric rivers. This week, the storm is expected to bring one to three inches of rain, especially here in Southern California. Flood warnings are in full effect. Residents of San Diego are preparing for the worst. They were just swamped by flooding last week. Locals are coming together and filling bags of sand for flood preparations. 
You know, I've been out here since five o'clock this morning filling bags, um, and the residents in this neighborhood, uh, they, they, they enthusiastic about the help. They've all come down. Um, as you guys can see now, there's uh, people from the community here all helping out, pitching hands. Later this week, a second storm is on track to hit the state. The next storm might even be a little bit more powerful than this first storm. Uh, but the big issue with the next storm is the, the length of time that we're going to be under the moderate to heavy rain. And so that's going to add up very quickly uh, and over a long period of time. So that could produce again, not only urban flooding, but we're, caught, we're talking small rivers and streams. The National Weather Service issued a winter storm warning for mountain areas in the Sierra Nevada. They could see up to 18 inches of snow. Server lining is that this week storms are expected to improve weather levels across the state. Stephanie Sakal, NTD News, California. Welcome back. Now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, plenty of sports today. Let's start in women's college basketball, where Iowa senior Caitlin Clark is now second all-time in scoring. How far is she from number one? Yeah, not far, actually. She scored 35 points last night and is now just over 100 points away from all-time leader Kelsey Plum, who played for Washington a few years back. But you know the amazing thing about Clark is that she's a really great overall player. She's among the career leaders in assists and rebounds as well, and she's just a six-foot guard. And now she's really become quite the draw to women's basketball, actually. According to VividSeats.com, which is a secondary marketplace for tickets, the top five most in-demand NCAA women's game this year have all featured Iowa. In fact, last night they played at Northwestern, and it was the first sellout in school history. Now, she's leading the NCAA in, at points at 32 points a game, so it seems almost a foregone conclusion that she'll pass the scoring mark very soon, probably sometime in the middle of this month. Well, now moving on to golf news, a three-time major winner Jordan Spieth says he doesn't think the PGA still needs a merger with Live Golf in light of their new partnership. Is that the general feeling? You know, it actually seems varied. You know, the main argument now is that they would still want to unify golf and have it under one roof. Now, that makes sense from an ownership standpoint, certainly, because why bid against each other when you can just combine into one and save money? I mean, this was the primary reason the old NFL merged with the AFL like a half century ago. Player salaries were skyrocketing because each league had their own draft. So players would be drafted into both leagues, and then they would end up bidding against each other to sign them. Now, there would be a number of difficult questions to answer should they merge. Like, what happens to all those players who switched to live golf? Would they get an equity ownership share as well, just like the rest of the PGA players? I'm guessing not, but would they even be let back into the PGA? Reportedly, what would even happen to Live Golf itself should they merge has reportedly become a sticking point as well, and they've been negotiating for six months already. In any case, the PGA getting these new U.S. investors certainly helps them compete with Live, financially speaking, anyway. Hmm. Well, now moving on to NFL news. The Washington Commanders hired Dan Quinn as their new head coach today. That's filling the last remaining head coaching job. Where does this leave Bill Belichick? Well, I mean, he could apply for an assistant head coaching job. And the Dallas Cowboys actually have an opening now that Quinn has left because he was their defensive coordinator. I don't think that'll happen, though. I mean, he's, he's way too decorated of a head coach to want that. And really, I don't think any head coach would want to have someone who's way more qualified for, than them on their own staff. But Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones was actually asked about whether he would be able to work with Belichick just the other day. He, of course, said yes. Now, that's significant for a couple reasons. One is that the Cowboys already have a head coach, Mike McCarthy, who's thought to be on the hot seat. And two, if they got rid of McCarthy and hired Belichick, it would really be interesting to see how those two work together. Both guys have a reputation of wanting control. But for the time being, it appears Belichick is sitting out next season. Well, now looking at the upcoming Super Bowl, San Francisco has generally opened as a slight favorite, but heavy betting on the Chiefs is moving that number of lines. Why do you think that is? Yeah, San Francisco is really thought to be the more complete team. They have nine Pro Bowl players this season. That was more than any other team. And really, you can make a case that receiver Brandon Ayuk should have been the 10th. But although, but, um, although they won both playoff games to get here, they weren't exactly dominant. I mean, Brock Purdy was very fortunate. Some of his passes didn't get picked off when they played Green Bay, and they only won by three points. One interception could have changed that game. And then they beat Detroit last week, but it took an incredible second-half comeback to do so. 
Kansas City, on the other hand, has really looked good in the postseason, better than the, in the regular season, I would say. Their defense has shut down some really good offenses. Their receivers, which were thought to be their weak point, uh, really didn't cost them at all. Now, the Niners are still generally listed as one to two point favorites, but that's down from Monday anyway. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tiff. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.